Hey guys, uh, here at Pulsar Fusion as a reaction to the incredible amount of interest that we have seen in what's happening here and very happy, actually really honored to be here currently. Would you be so kind as to introduce yourself to the viewers? Hi guys, my name is Richard Dynan. I'm the I guess, founder of Pulsar Fusion and um, we're very, very happy to welcome you. Thanks, Richard. Well, the, um, you know, we're going to start off with, uh, with a couple of questions about some of the basics. So you, you guys work on a, with a variety of different technologies. Yep. Behind us here are your, your hybrid rockets. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you've done with these and what your plans are for you know, more conventional rockets in the future? Sure. So, um, <clears throat> firstly, I guess, welcome to a very cold England. Uh, and I know you had a bit of a <clears throat> rainy time in Cornwall, so you know, thanks for trudging up here and seeing us. Uh, a little bit about, I guess, the hybrid rockets behind us. Um, these, these engines are ones we actually tested in 2020. We've decommissioned, well, actually decommissioned them, they just took them off the test stand and here they are. Uh, so these are uh, HDPE um, and nitrous oxide. We actually supercharged them with nitrogen and they gave a, a big old roar. Well, they, this, one of them was actually tested in Switzerland. We tested them in a snowstorm, uh, which was adventurous, and they were built on feed systems, which are portable feed systems, which was, again, adventurous, but we learned a lot about them. Um, and our, I guess we have three propulsion programs at Pulsar. Uh, you know, we're, we're probably going to move towards liquid. Uh, we're, we're interested in liquid hydrogen, and, um, you know, I, I, but I think that most of our technologies are moving towards, towards liquid from now on. But we've done a lot of hybrid work and we're very proud of it. And it's been a really a great platform. So is, is there an application for hybrid? I mean, I, I read on your website a little bit about the, the prospect of, of recycling, uh, you know, re plastics and that sort of thing. Sky Aurora talks about that too, yeah. using that as part of, of your propellant. Is there a potential market in that sort of thing for a green propellant, so to speak? Well, I guess hybrid's nice because it's a, it, you know, as you say, it's got a relatively benign failure mode. So if it goes wrong, uh, it, should stay within the chamber um, but it's, it's nice and clean you know you are using recycled plastics and, and um, you, you basically get water vapor out of it the applications I mean it's something like this I guess you use a signaling rocket um, there you know people like Virgin Galactic have used hybrid hybrid rockets to get you know actually propel it as a stage two engine um, they're also nice and reliable I think they've got a lot of factors which make them in certain situations like galactic I think you probably could choose them over, over a liquid engine but they're not for launch um, I, I don't know I think application wise I, in, in most situations I think if you can get a really reliable liquid system I'd, I'd go for that so that's the route you guys are heading towards in the future as part, as I kind of talked about in my previous video, as kind of part of an overall plan to fund your company as you move towards you know, your long-term objective, Fusion, which we're going to talk about here in just a moment. So uh, let's talk a little bit about your ION capabilities. It, I mean, it seems that you have a three-tiered approach to your company here. I mean, we've got conventional engines, and then tell me a little bit about your ION capabilities. Well, ION thrusters are you know, extremely relevant to fusion uh, scientists because it's, you know, plasma under electromagnetic confinement, which is extremely relevant to, to fusion. And it's the same kind of skill set. Um, so, it's one I made earlier. A, um, this is a Hall Effect thruster. It's a small Hall Effect thruster. The ones that we actually, we actually built some of the biggest Hall Effect thrusters in this part of the world, um, up to sort of about 20 kilowatt. And these, between five and 20, so these, these engines are um, primarily we focus on reliability, engines that can last a long time. So this one we're using materials like graphite over boron nitride. There's a boron nitride trench there. But just, and we're using things like machine learning to see how the plasma can best sit in the electromagnetic field without eroding these, these engines. So longevity, reliability, bigger engines is what we focus on in this part of the world. CubeSat, smaller ones, not, not really our, our, our area. Um, and we're actually, with the Space Agency, we're working on building one which is nuclear electric propulsion. So you're looking at one which has been powered off a fission reactor. Um, and that's something that is being explored 
here as well. Uh, we're building one of them now. So, well. so to be clear, you have received funding from the UK Space Agency to build nuclear electric propulsion, is that correct? Correct, yeah. Uh, and, and that's basically following our, we had funding from the government before for um, just demonstrating our conventional Hall effect thrusters. But now we've sort of shown that reliability, we've teamed up with some you know, uh, universities as well who are going to help us make these engines bigger and, and work with uh, uh, sort of more, our expertise is in nuclear fission, we're more fusion, but we've teamed up with people who are going to build the, the fission side of it so we can link it up to our Hall effect thrusters and at nuclear electric propulsion is an exciting new part of the company. So, I mean, wh what are capabilities looking like with that? I mean, obviously, if you're not using solar power and instead you're hooking up a, a nuclear well, reactor to it to an ion engine, what does that look like in terms well, of capabilities? It's a bit, a bit early in the study to tell you, um, but that is, that's why we're doing that work. Um, we're investing our own money into solar electric as well, but this is only because it's commercial. And as you said, as a fusion company, it's very important for us to show that we are also commercially minded. We're using our skill sets and our facilities to, to actually build a customer base, as well as just focusing on the moonshot of fusion, um, which eats up investors' money. We want to make sure that what we do is well thought out, uh, makes commercial sense, and that people want it. I don't want to build something that people don't want. So one of the questions we ask is, scientists come and say, you know, we could build this. I say, well, let's talk to the sector and see if people even want it. Um, and, and that's why, well, you know, where why we are where we are with these with these engines. So, I mean, I, people I would say who have tuned into this are probably interested in the fusion part of the conversation. Once again, to reiterate, <laughs> it kind of the, 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 the purpose behind these two projects, at least from what I see of your company model, is to get the necessary funding, to get the commercial backing in order to fund fusion. So tell me, I mean, you talked about a 2027 proof of concept date. I mean. How could that really be possible? How do you see that as being feasible? Well, nuclear fusion, it's very, very important, as people in the Atomic Energy Authority here and a lot of the best physicists will say, is we really don't want people over-promising because that damages the credibility of nuclear fusion, which is a, a very promising technology. Uh, more so now that you've seen the breakthrough at the National, National Confinement at NIF, people are starting to realize that this is not if, but when. Um, you know, we do set ambitious uh, targets, but we set them because we feel that they're realistic. Fusion is about a condition of plasma, uh, which we call fusion triple product, or the Lawson criteria, depending where you are. And if you can get to that level Q, which has got more energy in than out, then you know what, you can do fusion. And, and people can do fusion, but the question is, can we use it for power? And that's a very, very different question. Because if I've got my plasma under electromagnetic confinement, to use it for power and to make a power station, if you're using DT, I've got to have a meter of steel around that to slow my neutrons so I can use them for kinetic energy. And just keep, to, to make sure the viewers are clear, D DT stands for deuterium. Deuterium tritium, yeah. Uh, and if I'm, if I'm fusing that sort of heavy hydrogen and super heavy hydrogen, tritium and deuterium, my product is going to be neutrons if I'm successful. When neutrons are neutral, so they'll just bust out anywhere from the reaction. And I need to slow those neutrons in a material, whether it's like salt water or steel, to get the heat, which I can then use that heat to power a steam turbine. So you've got these belts, and then I, I need to have uh, maybe lithium-6 around that so I can breed tritium, breed my own fuels if it's going to be efficient. Then I have to probably have robot handling systems to maintain these reactors as they degrade, as they're exposed to these neutrons. Then I need to have a steam turbine around that, and then I need to have the infrastructure of power station and I'm going to need to get the locals to sign off on it and the government's going to get involved. So the sad reality about fusion for energy, and don't get me wrong, it is the dominant future power source of this planet. The sad truth in timing though is that once you can achieve the conditions, you may well spend 15 years building a power station around that. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe less, but if you look at how long it takes us to build even fission power stations, they aren't built quickly. So, why does Pulsar focus on propulsion for fusion? Because if you can get those same conditions in plasma, to make a propulsion system, I don't need to slow neutrons down. I don't need the belts. I don't need a steam turbine. I don't need to have 
change of robotic handling. I don't need to breed my own fields. I can buy them. You know, I can actually just buy in the fields. Um, I don't have to be actually breeding them. So that 15-year infrastructure project, uh, we don't need that. We just need to get to those conditions. And space is a much better place to do fusion. If I could choose, do you want to do fusion on Earth or in space? Space, please. It's a vacuum. It's freezing. It's minus 275 degrees. So great for superconductors. Great for fusion. Um, a lot of my expensive, heavy materials, you look at ITER or jet, most of this is vacuum stuff. I don't need any of that if you're doing it in space. So space is a great place to do fusion. Back to your question on why we set such an ambitious, ambitious timescale. So here you'll notice a lot of vacuum chambers and, and things like that, which is what we use for, for testing. But we've got a very big vacuum chamber coming, which is literally all about creating the magnetic field strength necessary to achieve the state of, I guess, the, the criteria of plasma is how it would have to be if you were doing fusion in space. And we would like to have that set up by 2025. So the chamber is literally on its way and you can see all the clearing being made way for it. And we have, yeah, it's, it's a, an ambitious um, time frame to do this sort of static test on the ground, if you like. But if we can show that those conditions are achievable, we then fundraise to get that done and in, in orbit demonstration as fast as possible. It's very ambitious. Is it impossible? No. But we obviously we talk about as soon as we could do if we had the funding. Um, but you know what? We are getting funding now, and the you know these these conditions are very very achievable. Um, and you know, as I said, we're we're not going to be spending 15 years building power stations. So, I mean, your plan then is by 2025, you want to have a magnetic chamber over there um, creating plasma inside a magnetic field right here in Milton Keynes. Uh, another chamber, but a bigger one. Yeah. So we just have to have, it's that sort of one Tesla type magnetic field that it's, you know, if you read about his, his, you know, in, in history, most of the time scientists have gone off and built, whether it be Zeta or z -pen, all these different types of reactors, they've come back and said, we need bigger magnets. <laughs> right. So we need some big ones here. Obviously. Fusion is magnets. So superconducting rare earth magnets to give you that electromagnetic field. On top of that, we're trying to get higher temperatures than tritium deuterium because with DT, you're creating neutrons. And neutrons, being neutral, will go anywhere they want. I can't divert them out the back of a rocket engine. Um, so we intend to use tritium and, sorry, we intend to use deuterium and helium-3. Now, when you fuse those two together, uh, rather than having a neutron as your product, you're getting a proton. Now, protons, not only do they not bury themselves into the wall of my, my reactor and start degrading it, um, but I can actually divert protons out the back of uh, a rocket engine. Um, and so that's why Deuterium helium-3 is the ideal fuel pair for rocket propulsion. It may be for energy too, except you have to breed helium-3 at a great expense. Um, you know, tritium isn't actually that available either, by the way. ITER will probably use the world's entire store of, of tritium. Um, but helium-3 is the perfect, helium-3 deuterium is the perfect sort of fuel pair for propulsion. Uh, and, you know, I don't believe in, in tokamaks in space. I don't know why you'd want to create a neutron device uh, that will start to decay, and you can't use that for propulsion anyway. So it can also uh, you know, potentially be a, a power source as well. So that's the logic behind why we're building a linear type helium-3 deuterium device for propulsion. Now, for those of us who are you know, familiar with helium-3 and all the challenges associated with that, obviously there's a lot of helium-3 on the moon. Yeah, but Not much here at all. So, I mean, do you feel that you, you, know, you can get enough yeah, you of can. that? So you can breed it. it. You can breed it. Um, it's, again, if you're trying to make it an energy efficient uh, setup for a power station, yeah, it's more challenging. But I can actually go along and say, look, if I'm going to save you several years in space, it's worth the cost of breeding the helium-3. Um, there's also, I don't know if you're, you know, viewers are interested in going into more of the science, but there's a lot of other benefits in, in building linear type propulsion systems. If you look at magnetic mirror fusion reactors, some of the earliest ones, 
there was a, a joke actually that the more magnets they had around the edge of them, it's a bit like a tree, you can count the rings to see how old it is. You can count the rings and the magnets to see how old these devices were, because scientists could not stop plasma leaking out the ends of these, of these uh, systems. Um, now, for propulsion, you actually want that. But the, the reason we came up with the tokamak is because the, the way they solved the problem was just to connect them and make a ring. But as the plasma was sort of going around in a circle, we discovered this problem called bomb diffusion, which scientists called David Bomb, and where the, the, the ions, if you like, would, would go to the outer, always be pushed to the outside of the, of the tokamak, and that gave you a problem of how do you keep them in the center. And that's where we came up with the stellarator, where you had a, a figure of eight, like a sort of scale electrics track, it would keep bringing them back into the middle every time. But these things got more and more complicated, more and more expensive, and you have to realize, well, is that ever going to be a power station? If it has to be like the, um, the Windelstein reactor, you know, it's amazing, um, what, you know, the, things like Sparamax and I just think that Tokamaks are, they're not perfect, but they will be the right design choice for power stations, likely led by governments though, just because they are federal sized machines and they will be as long as you use DT. Propulsion is, it just because of that reason, is able to come sooner. It's, it's fascinating to think about it. So, I mean, so do you foresee then a future, if you can prove that, that this works, um, that you could have, you know, a future industry of harvesting helium-3 on the moon in order to, you well, know, in order to helium to feed? Helium-3, the moon is rich with helium-3. Um, but the, the problem is, is that the lunar regolith, as we call it, um, you'd have to harvest tons and tons of it. And then you'd have to heat it up to about 400 degrees in order to process, process that and bring it back to Earth. And the cost of that would be sensational. Also, we can't put combine harvester sized machinery on the moon yet. I mean, probably very soon we can. Um, do, do people want to see uh, lots of combine harvesters harvesting lunar soil? I think the moon's quite romantic. I'd rather I think people want to leave the moon alone. Um, we don't need to do that for propulsion. Helium-3, obviously, it, it, it's in relative abundance in space, but um, you know, if you're, if you're building, again, if you're in space already, it's an ideal fuel, fuel power. So, it's, the, so the we can is, make enough of it. We'll make enough of it. To, yeah. to, very simple answer is you breed your helium-3. It costs you a lot, but that doesn't matter because I'm, you know, uh, speed in space is fungible with money. I can save you years of your mission time. It's worth the cost. Right. Um, and, you know, your, your exhaust speeds are about, like this, this whole effect thruster I just showed you, uh, the exhaust speeds from fusion are a thousand x that. I mean, we're, we're not talking about a little bit of an advantage here. Fusion gives you two huge promises. It's can humanity power a planet cleanly and indefinitely? Yes, we can. Yes, we are that species. The fact that we can do fusion proves that. The other promise is we can leave our solar system. We could get to Alpha Centauri, which is about four light years away, in a human lifetime whether or not that be the, the I, mean, I know what people are talking about sending robots instead but it's it means that we can leave our solar system it means we are that species so i mean we just talked about the the prospect of you know of going to alpha centauri that sort of thing so let's get into some specific numbers here if we're talking about um what's the exhaust speeds of the plasma out of the nozzle of the rocket well, roughly the theoried exhaust potential speed is up to 350 kilometers a second so you know, hundreds, which is obviously completely game-changing. And there is the fact that you have to, you know, you can't use a fusion rocket to blast off from the ground. It would only work right. in a vacuum. Once it's there, you might have to assemble it in orbit, in orbit assembly. You know, that isn't going to be super quick. But once you've got your fusion engine assembled in space, and then it's acceleration, deceleration questions. But yeah, you're talking about the potential to get to Mars in a couple of weeks, the ability to get to Alpha Centauri in, I think, 11 years. It's so it's completely game-changing. There is questions about radiation in space because you start traveling for that long, so, you know. But again, there are solutions to that too. It, there are other people that say, say that maybe we want to send AI or we want to send a computer out. Um, it, maybe people already have, there's the other one, you know. But it does mean that suddenly you can send things out of our solar system in, in you know, relative times that 
you know, rather than... You know, I mean, look, the universe is so enormous. Our, our local, you know, closest galaxies are, what, 100 million light years away. Right. I mean, that's 100 million years at the speed of light. It was just... It's always going to be, uh, so long as light speed remains unbreakable to us, it's always going to be out of reach. But it does mean we can leave our solar system. So, I mean, with the numbers you're, you're, you're talking to me about here, I mean, you know, you're looking with, um, for example, nuclear thermal propulsion has an exhaust speed of, you know, 10, maybe 12 kilometers per second, something like that. So double, maybe at, at best triple of what uh, chemical rockets can do. We're talking orders of magnitude beyond that, 10 yeah. times at mm -hmm, least mm -hmm. of what nuclear thermal propulsion can do. Have, has this been sparking some interest with the people who've been funding you? And, the, the UK Space Agency and others? I think there's, there's, this, there's this wonderful future, but also, especially with things like um, tests going wrong, I think investors are very focused, quite rightly, on picking companies that take on realistic uh, challenges and deliver them on time and on budget. Like, rocket engines like this, you know, we didn't go over budget, they tested very well, we tested them internationally, um, and we showed the competence that we can do things fast and on budget. Uh, we're very, very keen to keep one foot on the ground and say, yes, we, we have this, this moonshot, but we're also going to take on pieces, you know, how do you devour a whale, piece by piece. Um, and investors will get more and more confident if you can do that, rather than saying, look, this is the moonshot, we're going to raise 50 million and then we're going to raise another X and then another chunk of money and maybe or maybe we, you know, we don't do it. You know, fusion is definitely the future, but I think you could easily, investors could very easily be lured into investing in technology that may work one day but not actually be used. And, and that's the, um, the other problem. But yeah, there is very clearly a, it, look, can we do fusion? If the answer is yes, then fusion propulsion is inevitable. So, um, the, I guess we were talking earlier and you said that this has been a 10-year process for you at least, and for I mean, 10 years you didn't get any funding at all, yeah. and now all of a sudden you are. Do you sense a change in the environment here in Europe and in the UK in particular in terms of a willingness to fund space that didn't exist before? Fusion has a bad rep, actually, you know, with not this generation. The last generation, they say fusion, they roll their eyes and go, 30 years away, always will be. This generation, I do a lot of talks at schools, universities, people don't have that. They're like, oh, of course this is, the, uh, this is the technology that's coming and just the question is when. And now with inertial confinement success, you know, people are starting to realize that, yeah, that it is definitely going to happen. Um, I obviously believe propulsion will happen before uh, power because of the infrastructure. But, you know, it's, I think the, the mindset is, has changed. Ten years ago in England, when I was rattling my tin, people thought, fusion. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, no thanks. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, when we had our scientists come together and make electric propulsion systems that worked, people would say, well, actually, you guys have shown that you can make fairly complex systems work in a vacuum and get a plasma. Well, okay, your team has shown credibility. Then, you know, you start showing that you can build rocket engines. Eventually, people say, well, look, you're showing competence. You're showing that you can do things on, on time and on budget. And actually, now the successes are coming in more with fusion. I think investors are starting to realize, goodness, this is the future. Um, so, yeah, the environment has changed significantly in the last 10 years since I was, in, in the last couple of years since I, I I'd say, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's exponential, exponential change, but it's nice because for 10 years, you know, I've, I, I did have a hard time raising money. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Well, I'll tell you something. Um, I, I, I'm impressed with what I've seen. I mean, a lot of there are a lot of comments that were made um, on the previous video that I made that this was all CGI pie in the sky kind of stuff. Now that I've been here and seen what you're doing, and the fact that now it sounds like we've got a, a commitment from you to have a, a magnetic chamber there very soon that hopefully will be a new be, one. That yeah. hopefully will be creating plasma in a couple of years. It's the plasma it certainly will be. It's yeah. the question of is the electric, is, is the magnetic field powerful enough around that plasma? You know, we, all these machines around us are creating plasma. Um, it's actually getting those temperatures and, and showing the, you know, the confinement um, criteria. But yeah. So I came here with the objective of trying to see something tangible and, and to see if this was a credible thing. And I am indeed convinced, Richard. Thank you so much thank for your you time so much today. Thank you so much for your time. And I hope, you know, 
next time you come to England it's a little bit less uh, freezing and raining. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> So two other orders of business. First of all, please like, please subscribe. We are only a few thousand away from that magical 100K. And also please check the description for various ways to keep supporting this content so I can keep bringing you interviews like this. And the second thing, Pulsar Fusion opened their facility specifically for me. It was officially closed down for the beginning of January and they opened it up just just for this interview. I am very, very grateful for that. Thank you so much for your time, Richard. And until we actually do have a real fusion rocket making its way towards Mars and other destinations, I urge all of you to stay angry about space. <laughs>